Hey, and we're back with the MPL Weekly. I'm here with Marshall Sutcliffe and Eric Froelich, and I'm Becca Scott. And guys, wow, we already know one winner we in the one. Ruby Division. We have three more to go. These four players, one from each of four divisions, are going to go straight to day two to the top 16 of the next Arena Mythic Invitational. That's going to be June 21st to 23rd, coming up in just a couple weeks here. Championship. Uh, I know. I knew it. I knew you were going to do it. I do that uh, all the time. Her and I both worked at the Mythic Invitational, and when, when that's the first time that you're exposed to that name, it's it. I do it too all the time. Because I stood in the mirror <laughs> saying, <laughs> uh, but uh, it is indeed a championship. The Invitational does not count for uh, the Mythic points. points. That's right. Mm -hmm. But this does. Uh, so we do have standings for you now as we go into our Sapphire Division. We're going to watch three different games today, and then we'll catch you up on everything else that happens. As you can see, Ray Sato is at a 5-1 match record, which is uh, tough to beat. But Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa and Piotr Golgowski have a chance to take away this division, depending on a lot of things. Yeah, particularly <laughs> tough for, for Golgowski here, as he's still got two more matches to play as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, out of the seven matches total, uh, yeah, that's that's two. So he, he has to win both of them today, and he has to hope that PVDDR can beat Ray Sato, and then it comes to tiebreakers. We could potentially end up with three people having a 5-2 record. I we'll mean, Sato, Sato could make it easy on himself, right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, By just winning? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the easy way. We, we have in this particular split, Sato plays against Paula Vitor Dama de Rosa, so we're going to have a lot of information in that one match. I mean, Paulo, in a lot of ways, controls his own destiny. You know, he's a match behind, but, you know, he controls what happens to Sato this week. So if he's able to defeat him, well, then we have 5-2 record for both of them. Piotr has a chance to win both of his matches to also get in 5-2. That would create a three-way tie. However, if we just have a two-way tie, the way the tiebreaker works is that Sato is currently ahead of Paulo if Paulo wins two games to one because you talked about the game win tiebreaker being the first tiebreaker. So what Paulo actually needs to do is not only win the match, he's got to make sure that Sato takes zero games. He's got to win two games to zero. So uh, a lot of pressure on Paulo to come out strong, and he can't stumble at all. Oh, no pressure. No, no pressure. Eric, glad you're here, by the way. We have our very own <laughs> MPL player sitting right here. Now, we do have a head-to-head -to, -head to show you here of our first two players. This is Glogowski versus jean Noel Noël Dupra, uh, who you can see has a 3-3 three, three record. So one more loss, but uh, he's played one less game than Piotr Glogowski, also known as Canister, who was a pretty new player, but did very well in the Invitational. Meant to say invitational. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to see well. is it Phoenix deck versus the Esper mid range deck. Top finish for each of them. Here's the Praz deck. What do you think of this one? Yeah, I mean, this deck has not changed all that much throughout the last you know year. Um, a lot of the cards are very similar. We see the newest addition to the deck, kind of the only addition to the deck from War of the Sparks, because we're not we don't see any copies of Sahili in uh, Sean Emanuel's deck. But Finale of Promise is, is a big it's one. It's so crazy in that <laughs> deck the first time you have somebody play that against you and you're like, wait, that's all three spells? That's <laughs> not fair. And right. there's Sahili right there in the sideboard. Yeah. And Charging Monster Storm making a comeback, I believe that got a pretty high mark on limited resources. If it didn't, it probably should have. <laughs> I wasn't sure I would ever see it in Constructed, but there it is. Of course, that is Marshall's podcast plug for limited resource right there. <laughs> and here's the Esper Mid Rage uh, deck from Glogowski. And the, the key card here, I'd have to say, is Azor the Lawbringer, just because it's pretty much canister making a meme card. This card is a it's lot funny. of fun. Yeah, I actually uh, played this his list because I, I like the way that canister puts together his deck list. And it is funny in that it actually does things against this deck because it shuts down their <laughs> yeah. ability to get back any phoenixes for the next for turn, sure. which is kind of funny. Yeah, let's see the sideboard for Piotr. Yeah, a lot of those three mana planeswalkers in Fyodor's deck are huge. I mean, Teferi just completely turns off a card like Finale of Promise. And uh, Narset, if you can't draw cards out of the Phoenix deck, it's hard to cast a bunch of spells. A lot of your cards in your deck are just there to draw more cards, to yeah. be able to, to see more resources, to bring back Phoenixes, to make sure your Crackling Drakes are big. And so, you know, just a single Narset can really shut that down. Ooh, wow. 
Uh, that would be painful to not have any of that draw. Yeah, it's really tough because, you know, normally speaking, the play pattern with that is a deck is that they can get the Phoenixes into play, and then they can usually quite easily do it again if needed. And then the third time, usually they can get there, but after that, it's kind of like they've ran out of gas. But with Narset, it's like zero times, like, yeah. or maybe once, right? They can cast the spells, not get the, the draw effect out of it, get the Phoenixes back, but then they don't have any hand left. Right, and of course, Narset can be attacked, and it can be burned, but, you know, it's a pain. It's only three mana. Yeah. Well, and it's also, uh, you, you get it down to pretty low loyalty pretty quickly, right? You because can you choose. Use that draw. Yeah, it's interesting because you almost always do okay, just want to get the that. card. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do too. But this is actually a matchup where sometimes it's like, go ahead. Like, yeah. you, you know, I'm going to make you spend multiple cards on this one Narset. Because Ooh. the Phoenix has three power, and this is one of those matchups where Narset often just gets cast. I'll just let it sit at five, you yeah. go. And then next turn I can untap, still have the Narset in play, maybe be able to <laughs> deal with your Phoenixes, and you can no longer draw extra cards, and you're in trouble. Becca, oh, I, I like that pro tip. I, I'm learning No, no, I know you well enough. There's no way you would ever, you just like <laughs> minus, minus, minus. Control decks I don't are care hard cards. for me. It's, it's really a test of patience, because I play yeah. something right away, and I think I... Oh, I had that answer that I just spent because I had yeah, it, and I yeah. didn't hold on to it. It is a completely different play style, for sure. I mean, it's really impressive to watch these pros restraint. It's, oh, okay, well, this is an answer to that, but I feel like I'm going to need it to yep. something bigger, or I thought erasure, and I know I need it for yep. something bigger. Big, le big, big level up moment for a lot of players as they watch this level of play. It's Thank exactly you. that. No, it's me, Thank too. Thank you for I, acknowledging my level up hey, that's I, happening. I'm the same way as you, <laughs> Becca. I watch these guys play, and I'm like, oh, I should probably be doing that rather than the thing that I always do. So. I right. also like to learn which emotes I'm supposed to use whenever I cast <laughs> well, myself. Canister so canister this is, this is, is a big one lesson. for me. <laughs> Let's hop right into that lesson as Canister teaches us how to use emotes. <laughs> All right, let's get underway. All the pressure here on uh, Piotr Glagowski Canister on the bottom side of your screen there because he's got to win back-to-back -back matches here to put himself in contention for his division. On the other side of the table, Jean Emmanuel Duprat not currently in contention for the division, but still there's two mythic points, of course, on the uh, on the line here for him. So he is going to be playing his absolute best. Untapped steam vents go from him, and it looks like it's just a leave up shock. Yeah, I mean, this could signify more than just shock and that he could also have an opt, yeah. but in this case, it's just shock. Um, not particularly worried about taking too much damage early, as opposed to the tempo he might lose by having a hero come down if he then had to use shock on his main phase as opposed to casting something like a Goblin Electromancer. He'd, he'd much rather take the two damage versus uh, lose that potential tempo. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this deck, uh, the Esper deck, you know, if they do manage to untap with the hero, it, it, it gets out of hand so quickly that, right. you know, Depra just not willing to leave that option available. As it stands, though, Glagowski doesn't have access to Hero currently, but he does have Thought Erasure, and he's going to start mapping out a game plan. Yeah, this is definitely an interesting spot, especially when he's got copies of, you know, Three Man to Fairy sitting in his hand. A card like Goblin Electromancer is kind of a perfect target of you get to untap and just play a little Teferi. Um, Ooh, hello. Oh, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> you say hello. <laughs> he just says goodbye. <laughs> That's right. So he didn't want the Hero Precinct one. He's going to surveil that. But he did, of course, take that Goblin Electromancer. I agree with you, Eric. Uh, a very good target. And uh, you taking notes here, buddy? You need a pen? I got your back. So you say your go when they take two and a half seconds when before they, doing When something. they literally just <laughs> okay, drew their card okay. for the turn. I got it. I'm on to you. Ooh, another Thought Erasure off the top of the library now for Gagowski. And, uh, well, nothing on board yet for Jean-Emmanuel Dupra. Yeah, he's working with probably pretty close to perfect information and in that he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't know the last card in hand, but he can probably guess that it has to be an instant here. The fact that John Emmanuel chose not to cast a Tormenting Course or a Charter Course kind of signals that he's got something he's planning on casting instead. Um, very unlikely that he'd just choose to waste that mana completely. Could it just be a four drop? If it was a four drop, I, th I believe he would cast something like Tormenting Course or Charter Course. Just maybe to get rid of it. Well, to at least see. He can start with Charter Course and kind of, you know, uh, okay. really decide what he wants to do. Um, he might want to pit something like a Shock, especially with Finale already in his hand, right. as a, you know, a way to be able to get that back, even if he needs it. So it really does narrow it down, then, to those cheap instants that you were talking it's, about. It's extremely likely, yeah. yes. All right, well, he's going to play Teferi Time Raveler, and uh, plus that, so... <laughs> That's no fun if you're sitting in uh <laughs> Yeah, well, there's, he's seat. got both copies of Finale in his hand, which don't actually do anything with Nothing. Teferi in play. All right, well, he's found his first Arclight Phoenix. He still has a Charter Course to get in his graveyard, although it's going to get harder and harder to cast a bunch of spells in a turn. No more games. No more games. 
And it looks like he's going to have to just put in some serious work on Teferi. Time Raveler here starts off with a shock, but not really where you want to be when Teferi can very easily go up to four loyalty again the next turn. And here is a card that you mentioned earlier as a key in the matchup, Eric. It's Narset Parter of Veils. Yeah, and now we're going to see exactly what Piotr's game plan is. This Narset looks like he is just going to pass. And there we go. We even talked about that earlier. The, the rare case where Narset comes down and does not minus to draw cards, and we see it right here. So thank you, Piotr. We're make, making us look good. <laughs> I mean, look how bad his hand stacks up against these little Planeswalkers. I mean, Arclight Phoenixes <laughs> are, are great, but he can't even get him in. Like, he can cast Charter Course just to discard Phoenix. That doesn't really seem particularly great. Uh, Finales are doing nothing. Crackling Drake, fine threat, but he doesn't get to draw the card off that either. Um, you know, the Arclight Phoenixes are kind of the best thing he has, and he's going to have to hard cast them, it looks like, and he's still a mana shy from even doing that, so I expect him to flash back Radical Ideal while he can still get a card on Canister's turn, but this is a tough spot. So oh, he can't do that. I'm sorry, he's got a little Teferi. He can't even cast Instance. Right. So the Radical Ideals are dead, too. Elite Guard Mage was the play there for Canister. He draws a land off of it and plays it. There's Hero of Precinct 1. He could play that plus a Thought Erasure to start getting a better board state going if he'd like. Yeah, he also has the option to potentially start using this Narset if he wants to. He could cast Thought Erasure. He could cast Hero and then Thought Erasure and kind of see what's up to see if he wants to be using Narset's Minus. Or he can just find Big Teferi and <laughs> All right. start wrapping things up quickly. Yeah, so he minuses Narset now. And as Eric mentioned, finds Teferi, Teferi Hero of Dominaria, plays that pluses it, and now all of a sudden, Depra is facing immense pressure. The board that he had been facing before had kind of been locking him down, especially in conjunction with the fact that he's only on three lands at this point. But now the game is very, very much in hand for Pyotr Glagowski. And combo this is just the nasty. And it looks like that's going to actually draw a concession here <laughs> as Depra says, I don't even want you to let you see what I've got in my hand. That, of course, that combo that Eric mentioned there, Thought Erasure at instant speed during your opponent's draw step, which is not a kind act. Yeah, especially when you can't even cast your instance because Teferi shuts them down. So mm -hmm. uh, a huge pain. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how he sideboards here. Uh, Depra's list definitely a little bit different than a lot of the other Phoenix decks we've seen over the past you know, year or so that the Phoenix decks has really been popular. Uh, the Charging Monster Soars, a card that I think he's mostly le using for like the red decks as a, a card that is will end the game quickly before Experimental Frenzy can take over and also can't be killed by, you know, Lava Coil is the card that everyone brings in against the Phoenix deck. It exiles Phoenix, it kills Crackling Drake, it's kind of a great answer. It doesn't deal with Monster Sword particularly well. So, um, but Look it at looks this. like he likes it here too. Mon Monster Sword is in, although there's quite a few cards in currently. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of a nice answer for all of these Planeswalkers. You know, 5-5 five, five yeah. Trample can, is bigger than all of the creatures the Canister is going to have and can maybe kill a Planeswalker before it gets out of hand. Um, you know, if you're able to play Teferi, Teferi Hero of Dominaria, take that up to five, and uh, Charging Monster Sword could potentially just take that down in one swing. I just love seeing that Mythic Uncommon. See, even, <laughs> just, a, even just a flash of play yeah, He first here. picked those, so <laughs> you got to get him in. <laughs> Maybe it's because of the, uh, the style, the card style. He just... Uh, <laughs> it was pretty cool. He wants to show off. Yeah, uh, this, this is tough. Like, I've... I, you know, I also played against Esper Midrange this week, and it's one of those really tough decks because there are so many different lines of, I guess, threats, you'd call them. I mean, between the creature package with hero and thief-type cards and then all of the little planeswalkers and all of the answers, you know, the spells that you also want to deal with, the mm -hmm. Oath of Caius and removal spells. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a lot of different directions they can choose to take their deck. You're kind of guessing a little bit as to which one they choose to go with. And then if you have a bunch of shocks and lightning strikes in your hand for the heroes and thieves, and they end up playing a bunch of Planeswalkers because that's just how their draw lined up, well, things can look pretty bad for you. So it is a really tough deck to prepare against and to play against. All right, well, let's head into game number two. Again, all the pressure in this match is on Pyotr Gogovsky, who won game number one. Depraz is playing for a couple of Mythic points, but not nearly the stakes that Gogovsky at least has the potential to find. And now he's keeping, uh, excuse me, taking a look at keeping a one lander, but he's decided against it. And boy, this one looks pretty bad too, Eric. Yeah. Uh, oh, he well. kept it. 
Interesting. Wow, Basic Island is his only land. Now, he did get lucky here and find a swamp on top of the library, but he still can't cast his spells. Yeah, I assume this is a nod to the power of Narset maybe being the best card in the matchup, but that's a tough hand to keep. I guess he figures he has at least a few looks to find, you know, maybe a, a black and white source, of which there's eight, or at least one of the other, to cast a hero or to rest by turn two between, you know, the scry. Hey, it's an isolated chapel, and having played that swamp for the duress on turn one means that he gets to slam hero of precinct one. Now, he will not be able to play Narset with the lands that he has currently, but he does have access to Despark and Deputy of Detention if he uh, finds targets for such things which it looks like he will not. Well, I mean, not this turn, but those Crackling Drakes are some of the best threats that, mm -hmm. that are available to draw, and you know, he's got an answer to both of them right now. Although Lightning Strike will answer the Deputy if he needs to. He might just fire it off and get this hero out of the way now. This is definitely a tough call for, for John Emanuel. Yeah, he'd love to use up all of his mana here and cast Crackling Drake, and that is, in fact, what he decides to do. Crackling Drake is currently a 2-4 on the battlefield, as you can see, but he's got another one in his hand as well. Despark is going to take care of that first Drake and get him the 1-1 one, one token. Right. This plays out just perfect for Canister in that he got to use his mana and Seriously. cast a gold spell. So he's dealing extra damage. He got to exile the Drake. I mean, otherwise that mana is just going to go completely wasted. So here of Precinct 1 and Friend get into the red zone. And Canister is doing Canister things because that's just how he is. Oh, man. He must have had an extra cup of coffee before uh, <laughs> sitting down to battle his MPL match this week. Crackling Drake number two hits the battlefield. No land number four, by the way, for Canister last turn, so he wasn't able to deploy Elite Guard Mage or the Narset if he finds another blue source. He does have Tyrant Scorn, but that's not going to get the job done here against the Drake. So... He's going to kind of take the risky play here of running out Deputy of Detention on Crackling Drake and getting in for three damage. But, you know, it's not necessarily safe under that Deputy, is it? Yeah, it's not, not really a great place to be. There's lots of... Uh Actually, there aren't lots of ways necessarily for John Emanuel to kill a deputy. It is pretty unlikely for him to keep too many answers in his deck mm. that can kill a three toughness creatures because they're fairly likely to be dead. There's a lot of instances where having cards like Lava Coil in your deck just isn't going to do you a lot of good. And so I don't think he has any idea how many copies of Lightning Strike and Lightning or and Lava Coil are actually in the deck right now. It does happen that Depra has... Uh, a lightning strike currently in hand. And Which so. is a disaster, right? I mean, you get the trigger mm -hmm. again off yeah. of the, the Drake. You can also do this type of thing at instant speed, which can mess with combat. It's a pretty big problem. Now, he's going to just lead off, though, with Arclight Phoenix, play his mountain, and just pass. He figures that Piotr's not going to have any way to interact with the lightning strike anyway, so he can just uh, do it at his leisure. Thought Erasure, though, off the top of the library, is going to reveal the plans of one John Emmanuel Dupra. And it looks like he's going to go ahead and respond with Lightning Strike to make sure that that deputy dies. And there you go, a little sportsmanship now from Canister, who says, nice. Thought Erasure is going to take away Opt and leave Deprav with just Goblin Electromancer and two lands in hand. So the Hero of Precinct 1 doing a good job of building out a board, but currently can't even get in for damage. And it's gone now, too, by the way. Psst, shock. Yeah, I think things would be looking pretty good for him if he had another answer for the Crackling Drake, but he doesn't. And so yep. he's, he's on a short clock and doesn't have much of a board. And yeah, his hand doesn't do much either. He can Tyrant Scorn to uh, get rid of it temporarily, but that is a long-term game plan that does not end well. And by the way, that shock off the top of the library killing here of Precinct 1 has left Canister with just three 1-1s. One and he's just going to have to pass the turn back. But it's time for aggression if you're sitting in a pro seat. And an Arclight Phoenix off the top is going to only add to that. He now has 11 of the necessary 12 damage in the air and three lethal threats. It's going to be really difficult for Canister to get out of this mess. Yeah. His lands just didn't end up cooperating. He kept that one island hand, drew the swamp, got pretty lucky to hit the isolated chapel and just bricked off from there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of risk in this deck of keeping a one island hand, that's for sure. I was surprised to see him keep I mean, it, to be honest. Yeah, his hand was fine. Like, it wasn't a super exciting one land hand, but it might have been his best chance of winning. Going to five is, of course, extremely tough. Mm -hmm. He, you know didn't have, uh, you know, having access to a card like Narset in your hand and already one island means it's pretty like you're, you, likely you're going to be able to cast it in a reasonable time frame. Now, it turns out he was never able to cast it, so that didn't work out. But, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a gamble that didn't pay off this time, but 
probably probably a good keep. I, 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 I'm not sure. Lots of options to bring in here if you're sitting in canister C. Cards like Hostage Taker and Deputy of Detention can lock down the even Arclight Phoenix. Right. Keep it hidden away as long as those creatures stay around. He did bring in, interestingly, two copies of Oath of Kaya. What is he hoping to hit with that? Yeah, I mean, the Oath of Kaya, I guess, is mostly there for something like Goblin Electromancer. Okay. Especially now that he's going to be on the play again. You really want to deal with Electromancer immediately. And so being I on see. the draw and having a three-mana sorcery speed answer to the, your opponent's two-drop, it's a tough tough spot to be in. And so uh, making sure that you can you can remove those Electromancers with the most value you can get out of them. and. Oof, so this is a rough pretty opener. bad hand. Yeah, it looks like a mulligan here. No blue mana sources for him. Two fives and a six is pretty rough. Well, he's got to keep this one. He does have to keep Ooh, this one. Ooh, hello, here of Precinct 1. Does he have white mana available? Yes, he does. he does. There's a hollowed fountain down there. So he can play that one. This turn, lead off with Hero and force his opponent to have an answer, or he can go for the turn two Thought Erasure to sort of clear the way for the Hero, giving up a little bit of value and then try to uh, to ride the hero to victory. So let's see what happens here in game number three between these two. He's going to yeah. run out the hero straight away, Eric. I think we, we knew his, I, I don't know what the right play should be. I'm not going to throw that, I'm going to throw that out there. But okay. we knew what his plan was when he leads on Hollowed Fountain because he's going to play the land that, you know, his two mana spell is, is not going to deal him damage. Mm -hmm. um, so his plan was certainly to play the hero once he saw that on top. If he was planning on playing a turn two Thought Erasure, he would have likely led on Water Grave to then follow that up with the island. So uh, it, it was definitely pretty clear what his plan was. Whether he should have gone the other route, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> it's right. tough to say. Well, Hero of Precinct 1 hits the red zone here, and that's down to 18 for Jean-Emmanuel Dupra. I mean, the really interesting thing here is that Jean-Emmanuel did not choose the Lightning Strike. I'm not sure what he's holding Lightning Strike for, but what is now he, he can just get punished by, you know, Dovin's Veto is going to come down, stop the Lightning oh, Strike, no. and also create a 1-1. One -one. Is he trying to clear the way from some key spell? No, right? There's nothing in his hand that is super important here at this turn three juncture. I mean, getting Tormenting Voice hit by a Dovin's Veto is a disaster because the discard is also part of the cost. So you is that what he that was card. trying to do? I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't think that was really part of the plan. I think it might have just been maybe to save for like a Thief of Sanity type card. But, ah, uh, okay. Well, he's not even really punished for making that play because he could be facing down a board with zero power on it, right. and instead he's facing down four power and growing. Yeah, completely right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Canister has the answer to an Arc Light Phoenix and to Spark in his hand. He's got another Thought Eraser to help clear the way of something like Disdainful Stroke. And knowing about the Disdainful Stroke and the Spell Pierce, that is worth a lot too. Because you know, Canister's not going to play into any of those spells. I mean, he's a great world-class player. And this is, of course, the exact wrong play to make to Pra doesn't know that. It just turns out this way, yep. that the D-Spark in hand is perfect to answer the Arclight Phoenix permanently, get another token from the hero, and everything is coming up. Canister here in game number three. He's going to troll him a little bit with the thinking emote before immediately sending every available creature into the red zone. Mm -hmm. And we've probably only got a couple of draw steps left for Depra here to try to find something to get on board. He's got spells in hand, but he's got two reactive spells, two card draw spells, and he needs to find action. So he's going to opt into an opt. Yes, I mean, a Phoenix he can get back for sure if he's able to find one with the chart, of course, will be the third mm -hmm. spell. Um, oh, no. Spell Pierce, not good. <laughs> so that was probably bottom and then find Spell Pierce anyway. Yeah, these are just all bricks. I mean, the Opt is going to allow him more looks, but not till next turn, and Thought Erasure is going to take it. And he's on a one-turn clock with nothing in hand. So he just has to cold top deck something amazing, and with only five lands on board, one more coming. It's just hard to imagine. Yeah, I mean, what is the amazing thing to even draw? Right. I don't is even best draws Crackling Drake into, into something? Into Shock or something? Yeah, it's just not not a great option here, especially given that his life total is down to six. He finds, <laughs> oh no, Charging Monstrosaur. Our favorite has finally arrived, but it looks like it is a bit too late. Wow. And then, of course, the troll there from Canister. He draws. Well, the Teferi can't resolve through the spell pierce, so it's not That's over. That's true. That's true. He does not actually have lethal just yet. He's just going to take Disdainful Stroke, the, the clear answer there for the Teferi going down the line. 
Can Canister get any attacks in? Yeah, he can. He's just going to send them all in, give up the hero, but knock his opponent down to two right, with, with five, five creatures. Five creatures. There's yeah. nothing that he can do. Right. I mean, it's per this is one of those spots where it's an easy decision to give up the hero. Uh, there's just no way to kill all those creatures. That's right. All right. And that is going to do it for that first match here in Sapphire. That is Peter Glagowski. Now, remember, he's playing two matches this week. He needed to win both he's got halfway there so right and and then he's got to win both then hope that paula wins then all three players are stuck at five and two and of course that leads to the pie eating contest <laughs> to decide <laughs> who is the champion of the split but That's then right. again canister is probably pretty good at eating pie and trash talking his opponents while he does it while spinning your his go, your go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah he can do all those things i am relatively uh, sure of that Absolutely. Oh, wow. Well, what what an exciting match. Uh, and Canister's on his way to that pie eating contest. <laughs> but uh, it, One step it, closer, for yeah, sure. Yeah, one step closer, but it's still going to be a tight, tight rope to win. But, of course, two mythic points is a great, great addition to to his uh, mounting list of points there. And uh, mm -hmm. great showing. Yeah, it, it was a, a good performance by him, for sure. It looked a little close there in the first two games, game three. Boy, that Could have been close. one, that one, <laughs> yeah, turn one turn where Depra was like, you know what? Go ahead. You can have that guy, and then I'll do it. I'll just wait, you know, a few extra phases here. Really punished him because, I mean, he straight up lost to that hero. Just yes. straight up. That was the card that Kimmer killed him. said, you want to give me a little bit of rope? All right. Yeah, All right. I'll take it. He's like, we'll see. more, more, more. Your more. go. Yeah. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, we do have our yeah. next game from Canister all queued up and ready to go, so let's check out their head-to-head. -head. This is Marcio Cavallo and playing against Piotr, Piotr again. And they, uh, you can see the records here. It's not been the best split for Marcio. He's a record of one and four, but so many top finishes. Really great player. And this is the Esper mid-range mirror that we're going to see now. Yeah, this is interesting because Marcio, you know, one of the better players in the field, and this is that's a big compliment going to that particular field, and he's just had a really rough run here in the MPL Weekly. Yeah, I mean, the only person who's gotten... No, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's tough. I mean, every match is, is extremely contested. You're playing yeah. against players who, you know, had an incredible years last year and have, you know, had incredible careers, and so they, they don't give you very much room to maneuver. You just gotta, you know, play your best and then kind of hope for the best, too, because... Yeah, there's there's no slouches in the field. No, and, and and that's why I bring it up, right? It's it's because it actually shows that even a player of Marcio's caliber, you know, is capable of putting up just a lackluster performance. It's right. just a, a really tough, tough environment to try to pick up wins. But as we mentioned before, this is a similar setup, Eric, to what we just had, which is uh, Glugowski. It, the, really, the pressure's on him. Marcio's not in contention, so he's the one right. that needs to do it. But there's still those mythic points on the line, so it's not like uh, Marcio's going to show up and, and, and mail it in. I mean, the mythic points are worth a lot. The Pride might be worth even more. Yeah, I mean, yeah. everyone wants to win. Everyone yeah. wants to show off that, you know, they are great players. And, of course, all 32 are great players. We know that for a fact. But, you know, you still want to express that on the battlefield and, and show everyone what you're made of and get as many wins as you can. Like, there's a, there's a big difference between winning one match, two matches, three matches as far as, you know, but pride How points? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the pride points. Believe are a whole me, other I know. Yes. You need them. I know. Hey, and, and you know, I've had I've I've gotten messages from other MPL members as well that were just like, I'm sweating this. Like yeah. this is not the type of thing where they're like, Oh, is it Tuesday? I guess I better play my MPL matches. No, it's <laughs> like, you know, they're very focused on it and I'm sure uh, watching along with everybody at so home. So the high stakes and just that constant stress that you feel at a tournament, you can feel Every in week your in living the room. Oh, oh, you get to get that joy as well. But of course, there is a lot of joy in it, especially when you win. So let's see what happens for Golgowski in this next game, which he does have to win to even tie in this division. All right, this is it for Glugowski. He's got to win this one. That puts him in contention. It is uh, out of his hands after that, depending on the, the uh, way the rest of the division goes. But he knows for sure that if he doesn't pick up the win here, that he will not be in contention. So, right. good opener here for him. No one or two mana spells. I don't think he plays any ones. No, no nope. two mana spells. Uh, but uh, he does have a three, two different threes to choose from, as well as a four drop. And then... <laughs> His signature card, Ezor, the Lawbringer, the, <laughs> the one of fun of in his uh, main deck there. But it looks like Carvalho's down to five. Yeah, Oof. starting on five cards, this is already going to be tough. This is, you know, a, obviously a, an Esper mid-range mirror, quote unquote. Obviously, they're not playing the exact same deck, but a lot of similarities. And it really is a grind. A lot of things just come down to very small incremental advantages, uh, small amounts of card advantage, just being able to then press those advantages with things like the Fairy Time Raveler. Uh, yeah, being down cards is tough. There's, 
you know, when you start down cards and your opponent is going to continue making you down further cards, it's just hard, hard to come back from. This is the perfect illustration, by the way, of the power of Teferi Time Raveler yes. in Standard. This sequence that we just saw, where one player only has one you know, relevant permanent on the battlefield and Teferi's able to come down and return it to hand, it can be absolutely devastating. It really can. Teferi is likely to stay on the battlefield for the duration of this game and is just going to wreak havoc with the game plans. This was the big turn. Marcio really needed he to find a fifth land for Teferi. Oh. He oh. found another Teferi and then a Thought Erasure, so he cannot cast Teferi on time. And that's going to give, you know, Piotr some time. Let's take time a look. set up. Yeah, that, so this is uh, now, of course, Marcio's view as he takes away his card of choice. We'll revert back now to Canister. It's just a, nice to be able to take a quick glance at what's going on with the other player's perspective. But back-to-back -back elite guard mages, uh, Canister runs these Instead of Basilica Bell Haunt in his deck, it makes his mana a little bit better and serves similar, although different, function in that it draws you a card instead of making your opponent discard one. I'll tell you what, in this matchup, I like the Elite Guard Mages. <laughs> Playing against Red, you might you might talk me into the Bell Haunts, but... Uh, well, the real power here has been that it's turned off Thief of Sanity. Yeah, that's why I like massive, it. Massive, <laughs> it's massive. It's huge. <laughs> There's another answer for Thief of Sanity, but these Elite Guard Mages are doing, well, what they're paid to do. They're guarding. Yeah, I mean, these... Is Canister these going to his end step? Oh, he's, okay. he's setting a stop so that when he casts a fairy, he's going to draw a card, and he's going to cast Tyrant Score on his own turn gotcha. to kill the Thief of Sanity so that he can't... Nothing bad can happen by letting your opponent, you know, potentially untap Marcio. Good, smart, tight play here from Canister. He doesn't actually have anything to stop a Tyrant Score, except for maybe his own Tyrant Score to bounce his creature back to his hand. In which case, he'd probably be fine with that anyway. Right. <laughs> but uh, but as it stands, he does resolve Tyrant Scorn here, of course. And now it's back on Carvalho, who finally finds his fifth land and resolves to ferry Hero of Dominaria of his own. Is it too late, Eric? It's not completely too late, but it's kind of too late in that you can look that, you know, Piotr has four more cards Ooh, in hand. Narset. They both have five lands. They both have to ferry. Piotr both has four more cards in hand and two creatures in play. <laughs> and eight more life. Not that the life is particularly relevant here. No. But He's you know, ahead Marcio's, on all metrics. Marcio's Teferi is under a ton of pressure. And Piotr's hand is stocked. So, yeah, he's in a, a ridiculous amount of trouble. Is it insurmountable? Probably. Not 100%, but okay. probably. Well, we'll see how a canister navigates these next turns to see if he can actually get the job done. It does look like he's in a beautiful position to do so. Right now, he's debating between using Teferi, Teferi Hero of Dominaria to keep fueling that card advantage, or if he wants to start pressuring Teferi, excuse me, or using Teferi to minus on the opposing Teferi. And, and he's, he's decided Narset. against it. Narset locks it up. Narset just shuts down that Teferi. That's right. So he can just attack the Teferi, and the Teferi plusing doesn't actually draw any extra cards. So the Narset is a great answer. He would also have probably play the Thief of Sanity that turn. Didn't really check out the rest of his hand, but Thief of Sanity or something better, and Thief would have been outstanding there. So yeah. the, the, the game was well in hand, and, and Marcio moves on to the next one. So easy game here for Piotr Glukowski. He needed to pick up two match wins today to keep himself in contention, and so far he's got one match win done, and he's up a game over Marcio Carvalho and uh, is looking good to uh, to do so. Now, he does need to win one of the next two games, of course. And then we mentioned it earlier, but it's worth noting that Glagowski is playing to try to put himself into a potential three-player tie. Yes. Uh, a, a lot of things need to go right for him to do it. But, of course, when you're playing, well, you can only control the things that you can control. And so, they, you know, he right. probably looked at the sheet and said, well, I got to win. Yes. And then I'll uh, cross my fingers after that or start cursing people or whatever it's. I mean, th different strokes, you know. You and I have no idea what the results of these are, too. And I no. imagine that Piotr also is sitting there watching the show right now, also not knowing what the results are. I agree, too. So, yeah. I mean, he knows the results of his match, but he does not necessarily know what happened between Sato and, and Paulo Vitor Damodoroso. We don't know. I don't know the results of any of the other matches in my split. So. No, we, we had our, our prep team here, our production team, and the people from Wizards of the Coast. Uh, kind of alter the documents and stuff to make sure that we would know because I mean I want to experience this stuff. My, know, my po main point was that the well. members of the MPL don't know either. It's yeah, not like we're sitting around talking about our results and whatnot. No one says anything, and so uh, we, we do to? all tune into the show. Do you know if you we can. can, we're not supposed You're to. You're not supposed to. Okay, <laughs> but uh, that's what I was asking. Yeah, he kept a land heavy handed, uh, did Glagowski, and finally, 
It looks like uh, Marcio gets to keep a seven carter, so yes. good job. Yeah, and the there. honest truth is it's really hard to mulligan against a deck that plays Thought Erasure. And yeah. Marcio is also playing Duresses in his main deck. Mm. So uh, ev even harder to, to mulligan hands. Uh, the land heavy ones are a little bit more susceptible in ways to cards like Thought Erasure because you could lose your only spells. But, you know, a lot of hands that you're going to mulligan into might be relying on specific spells to then find more lands. So you're looking at, like, maybe a three-mana Teferi and hoping that that card draw helps you out. And so once you get Thought Erasure into rest, then, you know, losing those spells might mean you get mana screwed, which is a much bigger problem than uh, having a couple too many lands, especially with a deck that has so much card advantage in Elite Guard Mage and Thief of Sanity and all the Teferis in Narset to yeah. find more cards. That was a big Thought Erasure there, by the way, for Canister. He took away Little T... Uh, and and made it so that Carvalho does just nothing on turn three rather than cast one of the best spells that he could there. Here if Precinct 1 once again is going to get surveilled away, it looks like Canister's having none of it, but uh, he's sort of working his way up the chain, and once again, with a very controlling hand for Carvalho, only answers in hand, he uh, has to just pass the turn back. Elite Guard Mage is going to hit the battlefield now for Canister, which is going to get him three life on a card, and it's the type of card that if your opponent kills with a removal spell, you just shrug and say, sure, no problem, I don't even care. I mean, also, Canister is building up to this Command the Dread Horde, and this is one of the most powerful cards in all of Standard. The graveyards are getting stocked thanks to things like Thought Erasure taking away powerful spells. Wow. Here's another one. That's, although three, that's two in a row off the top of the library. And now he can take away uh, either one of these spells. He's going to take away the Elder spell and continue to ditch lands. It's kind of funny. Canister kept a very land-heavy hand and has been surveilling away lands and drawing <laughs> more uh, Thought Erasures every turn. And this hand is looking great, uh, especially backing up what your point Eric, about uh, his the potential for Command it's the Dread Horde right to be now. devastating here. And what this is going to do, it's going <laughs> to draw him some extra cards. It's going to make Marcio discard a card. Teferi is going to mean that he can't even respond with an instant here. <laughs> and he draws Ezor the Lawbringer to, to lock things up. Of course he does. Boy, this has not been a fun run here for Marcio Carvalho. It's just been all canister. We uh, might see canister bounce his own Elite Guard Mage here. Just to get a little Val. Right. Yeah, do it. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Preparing himself for the uh, Modern the Horizons <laughs> blue-white archetype here. <laughs> it's the same situation as last game where they both have six lands, yep. but Piotr has two creatures and a Planeswalker and four more cards. Right. Again. <laughs> so which you, you prefer Piotr's side? I'm, I'm, I'm trying Slightly. to understand how this Slightly. works. Yeah. Uh, Teferi, Time Raveler. Hits the battlefield for Carvalho, but it does look like it's too little too late, even if he does get to return his own Basilica Belhan bat to hand. Oh, it's Command the Dreadhorde. He, he drew Command the Dreadhorde here as well. Uh, the problem is the Graveyard just, just got left? emptied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I don't think there's anything in there currently. I mean, that can change pretty quickly, but there's not all the time in the world here. Land, Guard Mage. Plus a token from Hero. Let's see what he draws. He's going to get this information first. Another copy of Narset, which was his play anyway. Yep. So he's going to run out Narset, and it's he's pretty free to start minusing here. Wow, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, he finds with Narset, and that has to be the nails in the coffin here for Carvalho. Again, the Command the Dreadhorde, a powerful option in his hand, but currently so. not doing enough. Interesting to note. Should this game play out enough turns that Marcio does not concede, we're going to get to see Canister in the same turn cast a Liliana, Elder Spell a bunch of Planeswalkers, and then ultimate Liliana. The <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> wow, he finds Dovin's Veto. He may just not need to do that because he finds enough cards like Dovin's Veto to make sure that nothing bad can happen to him. But mm -hmm. He did a quick graveyard check there because of Command the Dreadhorde, but realized the same thing that you and I had last turn, which is there's just really nothing doing with it right now as far as graveyards go. And there it is, Azor the Lawbringer goes on the stack, triggers Hero of Precinct 1. This is going to prevent Marcio from casting instants and sorceries on his turn here. And also on Piotr's turn, thanks to Teferi. That's right. Law has <laughs> definitely been brought. Now, I want to tell you, Eric, that Teferi does not stop you from casting sorceries on your opponent's turn. OK, yeah. that's good. To so I wanted that clarification put into the record books. It's clarified. Yeah. You Thief just can't sanity? cast spells at instant speed, right? Uh, for what? For Teferi, you mean? Yeah, like you can't, you can't cast Frilled Mystic. Right. So 
I think it does stop you from casting sorcerers on your opponent's turn. Wait, if you oh, both does have it? A <laughs> if you funny. both have little Teferi out, <laughs> yeah, each opponent can cast spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. So I was right. Oh, man, thought I had one there. Oh, that was close, man. If I got one wrong to Marshall. Yeah, it would have been sweet. I could have just walked off. <laughs> and Liliana it looks like we're seeing down. the good game. It's a Liliana Dreadhor General. And boom, Pyotr Glagowski makes it look easy there. Picks up both match wins. All right. Well, Pyotr's still in it, in contention for this division, the Sapphire division. and He did everything he could do. Yeah, Carvalho must have felt bad to concede with 24 life there, but it was an interesting board <laughs> yeah, state. But yeah. that game was done. Triple uh -huh. Planeswalkers. I, 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 trust me, it wouldn't have felt any better if he took 20 damage next turn. <laughs> sure, sure. Oh, wow. Um, a very impressive win from Piotr. We saw, you know, a little more aggressive on the emotes that, that first matchup. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he tailed he off. Got he got tired. Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> His emote <laughs> finger was already used up yeah. for the week. You yeah. got to rest him after a while. Yeah. It's, it's hard work. Sprained it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, it's part of the training in uh, in entering the MPL. Oh. Um, I think he's going to be teaching a course. Eric next never week. mentioned that part to me about the emote <laughs> Most spam. players uh, ignore I've it. <laughs> I've heard that his opponents have started muting emotes because it was too much. So. Yeah. Oh, I would too. Now, uh, okay, so this is really interesting. So uh, the tiebreakers are pretty interesting. Glugowski, it could look really good for him if um, Piotr, uh, sorry, Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa beats Ray Sato 2 to 0 victory. Uh, then, then Piotr would probably win a tier one tiebreaker. Um, well, he would be in the tiebreak, right? But I think if I, Paulo I think wins, he would actually have it, right? A would? Uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, we'll, I, have to, we'll have to I, wait. I think the so tier one might go. When you Lugowski, expand it out we'll from two players to three, it gets very, very <laughs> complicated. Yeah. So it yeah. wasn't the pie eating contest? No, Who we decided against it. Yeah, <laughs> well. sorry. That that got vetoed. Yeah, that's wishful thinking. It, I it would was love illegal. To be it's in how Dr. Richard Garfield would have wanted it, but whatever. <laughs> nope, it's fine. <laughs> it was a legal decision, Eric. There's a lot of risks when it comes to that. Right, very much so. Yeah, the choking is a factor. All right, now we do have PVDDR and Ray Sato, the match we've been talking about. Sato could just run away with that 5-1 record right there, but PVDDR could tie it up with by being 5-2. And 14 top finishes, one of the best players in the world. Yeah, th this is this one's really interesting because we, maybe we haven't talked about it enough, but Sato can just win. Like, oh yeah, the easiest route here <laughs> is just him winning against Paulo Vitor Domino Rosa, finishing six and one, which puts him clear of everybody. No pie eating contests, no <laughs> no tiebreakers. He would just simply win his division outright. So that the pressure is very much on him. Turns out we've contacted all of the world's best mathematicians, and you do not need a tiebreaker if there's no tie. Oh. So uh, yeah, or Sato. pie. <laughs> You do not need a tiebreaker or a pie breaker. It's a case. celebratory <laughs> pie. We've seen the mono red eye grow before. A pretty similar setup from PVDDR. So many times. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a solid choice. And the gruel What is that red deck playing again? Yeah. Uh, how, how similar is this to your list? This is the, the slightly different version, right, Eric? It, it's definitely quite different. My deck is playing cards like Paradise Druid, uh, very similar list to what we saw with Lucas Esper for two. Uh, in his place, in that place, Sato is playing Thorn Lieutenant, which is much better in this matchup. Paradise Druid, huge liability against Goblin Chain Whirler. Thorn Lieutenant, great blocker and very good against the red removal spells. So mm. I think his deck is better matched against a red deck. All right. So uh, interesting choices from Ray Sato, and it's exciting to see a, a non mono red <laughs> deck <laughs> in well, these matchups. At least one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll see plenty of red cards. We do. We do love the red cards. All right. Well, we do have the game ready for you, so let's get right into it. Raisato and... Paulo Peter Domino Rosa. <laughs> I got you, Becca. All right. So let's get into it here Pablo again. Pablo Dorito. <laughs> the, the real pressure is on Ray Sato. And boy... The real pressure is on both these players. Paulo's in the no. mix. Yeah, but, but Ray can win the division with a win here. Like Paulo he, might be able to, too. Yes, but I'm saying <laughs> Ray, we know, can that's yes. the difference, is that if you're sitting in Ray Sato's seat, you're in a position where you have a clean win and in for your division. True. But the interesting part is you're playing against the best player, yeah. right? The player with, yeah. the, I'll, I'll sum this up, the player with the best resume in the whole MPL. Oh, yes. So by a lot. And, you uh, know, you can, and 14, 14 <laughs> oh, yeah, top he's finishes. Got, he's got okay, Eric, I'm, I'm, I'll put those on the table, and you can come up with three or four other players to try to match that. But Ooh, I can use four players. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, in the meantime, Growth Chamber Guardian hits the battlefield after a quick start here from Paulo. That's uh, a Vichino good hand from Sato. And Giru Lava Runner. You like that hand? Consistent. It's going to be able to cast a Gigantosaur on <laughs> <laughs> um, This is not started out well here 
for for uh, Sato. He's got a five forest in his hand and just a growth chamber guardian. Now, there's a big moment here. If this growth chamber guardian can survive, he will be able to play a land adapted and start to fuel his hand going forward. If it dies, I mean, he is just stone cold top decking with only lands in hand. The good news for him is taking a quick look at Paulo's hand. He doesn't actually have an answer for it. Oh, I lied. Where did that come from? Did I just miss that? Yeah, that was in his hand. He kind of moved it Sorry. up, was waiting to cast it. Oh, he had it kind of hovered. All right, my bad. Thank you, Paulo, for that, by the way. And there is a light up the stage after combat, and this is a disaster for Sato, even a fanatical firebrand. He needs to find action right now. And he did. It's Gruul Spellbreaker. Uh, that was his best draw. Uh, will it be enough? Probably not. But mm -hmm. you got to start somewhere. Yeah. So he's going to put the plus one, plus one counter on the uh, Spellbreaker before passing the turn back here to Paulo, who's got another light up the stage. So Paulo has the option of basically attacking with his two power creatures and using Chain Warrior and Firebrand to kill the Spellbreaker while also casting light up the stage if he wants to. He also could have just played the Frenzy, but I, I like his play. You're getting in some extra damage and making sure the Spellbreaker is actually off the table and progressing your board with the Chain Whirler, so all good things. So he's going to fire off Light Up the Stage first. That He actually did find the Mountain there, though he had it in his hand anyway. Then we will see Goblin Chain Whirler and Firebrand combine two more damage onto that Spellbreaker and leave Paulo in a beautiful position here with five power versus nothing, and that mountain should do it. He had yes. no wiggle room whatsoever. Even with ideal top decks, he may not have been able to find his way out of this game thanks to Experimental Frenzy down the line. But as it stands, Ray Sato, he dead. Well, let's keep in mind, too, that something we talked about a little bit earlier is that Paulo can't just win this match if he wants to win the split. Right. He needs to win two games to zero. So there is no wiggle room for Paulo. Paulo could not afford one of these games where maybe he drew eight lands and a few spells. Sato might be able to afford it. That's right. So game one goes to Paulo Vitor Domitorosa. He needs to win two games to zero to keep himself ahead, try to win this split. And he has won game number one in impressive fashion. That draw for Sato just completely fell apart. Right. I mean, it was a bad. He kept what a five lander with a with a growth chamber guardian, which is not a good start. I mean, yeah. growth chamber guardian, just, it just dies to everything yeah. on the red deck. Yep. I mean, it's one of the cards you really want to see. Um, you'd much prefer to be able to cast it, you know, when your opponent can't immediately burn it, especially when you have five mana available and maybe activate it right away. Red decks don't generally give you that much time, so putting it out there at least puts a, a small speed bump out there. If Paulo didn't have the Wizard's Lightning, it might have been the card to, to help him get back in the game, but Experimental Frenzy was still just probably going to be too much. It's always too much. <laughs> uh, Actually, today Almost it always, yeah. except for when they have Adonis Klein. <laughs> That's right. Okay, but players are finished with sideboarding, and uh, we're heading into what will be our last match for the Sapphire Division here in our first split. So this is going to be interesting because, well, first we get to see if Sato can just get the job done. If he cannot, then we're going to uh, potentially be looking at some tiebreakers here. All right, well, this is, is... this better? Yeah. I mean, a lot better than the last game. He still has the Growth Chamber Guardian, but now he has some 4-4s four to go with it. The big issue is he doesn't actually have answers to things like Runaway Steamkin. And those are definitely cards that can run away with the game left unchecked. So first things first, though, Paulo's going to make sure that this Growth Chamber Guardian doesn't get out of hand and start fueling future Growth Chamber Guardian. So he's just going to Lightning Strike it on his turn. But that means that Ray says, OK, no problem. Gruul Spellbreaker, your move. I've got a 4-4. Difficult to deal with for this red deck, though Runaway Steamkin can hit the battlefield here. Uh, Paulo needing to play off curve a bit here. Yeah, his hand is just kind of clunky. I mean, not being able to add another spell to the Steamkin. Steamkin's a great card, but you have to be casting other spells or it does nothing. And so if he's going to have a handful of three and four mana spells, it's going to be hard to grow that Steamkin. If it's not growing quickly, when your opponent plays a bunch of four power creatures, you die. Right, and this is sort of the name of the game here for Gruul. It was 2-2 two, two into 4-4 four, four into 4-3 four, Flyer. I mean, that is Absolutely. a beautiful curve and may be able to just simply outpace what it is that Paulo's got going on here. So he's going to add another runaway Steamkin and try to set up some absurd explosive turn, either next turn or the turn after, but his life total is going to suffer greatly in the interim. Right, and it's just really hard to have those explosive draws without cheap cards. I mean, right. you need to cast multiple spells. That you, 
if you're going to cast a three mana spell off your Steamkins, well, you're not going to be able to cast a single other spell. You need to be able to cast multiple one mana spells, and it just doesn't have them. Well, this There's could a be a game changer. Okay, Vyashino Pyromancer. It's a good way to start. Now the counters are starting to flow onto the Steamkins. It's also kind of a freeish way to turn on a light up the stage. That's right. So he would love to see a land off of this as well to keep this. He just got lava coils. Yes. And I say coils specifically. Oh, yeah, that's kind of rough, isn't it? He did find that mountain, and that will be the end of the festivities here for this turn, though, for Domita Rosa. He still gets to play a Phoenix, grow the other Steamkin, and play a Chain Whirl if he wants to. So he can still do a couple things. Of course. They're good. They're not, they don't seem like they're quite good enough yet, but they're getting him closer. Okay, this so game's thi not over. this is the beginnings of this Runaway Steamkin times two plan yes. coming together. Yeah, I mean, this board's going to look a lot stronger. He had the option there to also play a Chain Whirler and grow his Steamkins. He's going to try to set up to kill the opposing right. Phoenix Egg at some point. Is that what he's doing? I assume so. Also, having a 4-4 Steamkin against the 4-4s four is, is a nice position to be in. Okay, he just He also just might want trick. the most amount of mana next turn, planning on using a Frenzy. A shock off the top of the library here for Sato. With his opponent at 8, means that he may start to uh, look into some attacks here. Yeah, this is this is a really like you don't have a lot of turns that are particularly interesting for the Gruel deck. Yeah. It's mostly Gruel Smash. Um, a yeah. lot of the decisions come in: do you give haste or not? And there is actually that decision here of it is potentially an option for him yeah. to play a Gruel Spellbreaker and attack with haste. It doesn't necessarily seem that way with the four four on the other side of the battlefield. But when your opponent's at eat, you know, getting in that those trample creatures and making sure your other creatures can hit is definitely worth something. Um, he decided against it. And Paulo looks like he's hanging on to that runaway Steamkin on the other side, at least as a block sit currently. He could trade it off for the opposing Spellbreaker. Yeah, he has that option. Um, the, the shock in, in Sato's hand is really interesting here in that he can use it to blow out Paulo in combat by killing one of these creatures. There's a little bit more risk in using it on a Steamkin because there still is mana available mm -hmm. from PV thanks to the other runaway Steamkin. So if he fires off the shock on the 2-2 Steamkin, he might use the 4-4 four, four Steamkin to then cast something, um, a Lightning Strike, a Wizard's Lightning type card, and, and potentially grow the Steamkin out of range. Now, it still means a lot of damage. Even if that Steamkin were to grow, the trample from the Gruul Spellbreaker means that Paulo would take two trample damage, the Steamkins would die, etc. Right. Um, but he just actually, actually let it happen in order to use Shock to take care of the Rekindling Phoenix permanently. That's what it looks like he's going to do. Um, is, isn't, isn't that what he's going to do? I, I think so. It's not his only option. Of course, your opponent's still at three life, and you That's have right. potentially a lot of trample damage in play. It's got to be tempting, though, to just shock the egg, yes. play the Brontodon, and pass. It's and so risky a, not to. And then have a lethal spellbreaker for next turn as well with right. haste. So that is the plan that he's going to put into action here. Ooh, Oof. Lava Coil off the top of the library. That's a great draw. Now, can he do everything he wants to? Chain Whirler seems obligatory because he needs to get rid of that egg. Yeah, he's a, he's a little bit short, for it looks like, from doing everything. He can cast the Chain Whirler. That will make the Steamkin a 2-2 again. He can cast another spell, but he can only cast one more spell, I unfortunately. See. Okay, but that does get rid of the Rekindling Phoenix Elemental, so it will not be coming back. So Paulo's just going to add a Rekindling Phoenix of his own and keep that Lava Coil in his hand. Is this Paulo stabilizing? Because if I'm snapshotting right here, he looks like he's in a good spot. Yeah, Sato needed a spell there to, to really you know, push wow. it. If he was to play the Spellbreaker with haste, it doesn't really give him a great attack. It allows him to, you know, the Spellbreaker can trade with the Phoenix. Um, Boy. Where, where he takes one damage. The Chain Whirler just eats the Spellbreaker with haste, and the Brontodon would then eat the Steamkin, but the Phoenix will come back, and so it will be a Brontodon versus a Chain Whirler and a Phoenix, and Paula will still be at two life. So that's not a great place to be. Wow. This is about as close as they get here for Paulo Vitor Rosa, trying to win this two games to zero to put himself in a position to win his division. And he has stabilized Ray Sato, says no attacks, your move. And the other thing, of course, that's just looming over this game is that experimental frenzy in hand for Domino Rosa, where right. things can get out of hand in a very quick way. Of course, especially with that steam can already in play. Yeah, this is going to be a turn where Paulo fires off this uh, lava coil. I assume he's going to kill the Brontodon Thrash, here. Thrashy B's got to go. And, uh, you know, clear the way for the Frenzy and just hope that that wins it. 
Here he goes, crosses his fingers, puts Experimental Frenzy on the stack with some of his mana from Steamkin, and let's see what he can do. Well, he found a Viachino Pyromancer off the top of the library as well. He has no cards in hand, and his opponent down to 15 life, but he has oh. to pass a turn, and there's Lightning Strike off the top of the library for Ray Sato, and that is exactly lethal and exactly what he needed to see to even things up. That's a Big loss there for Paulo. I know he's still in it for this match, but he needed to win 2-0. Yeah, that I think just completely eliminates him from the split. Uh, Sato still looking for the win to avoid the, the tiebreaker situation, get that six win, get those extra <laughs> mythic points. And to be fair, he had a reasonable number of outs. He's got, you know, a handful of flying creatures in his deck. Of course, there's a Phoenix on the other side of the battlefield. A Hellkite, though, would have threatened to end the game pretty quickly. Mm. Um, Frenzy might have been able to get him out of that. But he did have four copies of Lightning Strike, and I think he had three copies of Daredevil in his deck that game. I think he went down to two maybe on the draw, which could have taken a burn spell out of Paulo's graveyard to uh, win the game as well. Oh, well, he, he did easy mode then. <laughs> He's just like, eh, I could just top deck a lightning strike. Good. He the could, old he did. bolt off the top of the library gets the job done there for Ray Sato here in game number two. But we've got a game number three as well. And let's see who it is that can actually finish off here. Again, the pressure is on Ray Sato. It is his to win. If he wins this game, he will take the split. And he will not have to do any tiebreaker math against Piotr Glukowski. He'll just be your winner. And of course, these players are playing for a big prize. They get automatically into day two at the next next Mythic Championship. Now, this also looks like a nice start here for Ray. He gets rid of that uh, Steamkin right away. Yeah, I mean, making sure that can't get out of line is, uh, is a fantastic place to be. Wow, just these drew perfect, on the draw. too. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> Spellbreaker here off the top of the library right on turn number three when you want it the most. And now he's got a 4-4 that is a big pain to deal with if you're sitting in Apollo's seat. Runaway Steamkin number two, but no more lands here for Domita Rosa. And a second rekindling Phoenix off the top of the library means that Ray Sato is going to have action for days here. And I wouldn't be surprised to even see him start to attack at some point. Yeah, he, he's definitely, I mean, I guess there's not really much of a corner to turn when you're still at 20 life, but he has kept this game stable all along, had the answers for the one drops and the two drops, and now it's just playing the bigger spells. These are the games that the Gruul deck tends to win against the red deck because the creatures are just bigger. Now he has the option of playing Cinder Vines and leaving up Lightning Strike or just killing the Steamkin with the Lightning Strike or just slamming Rekindling Phoenix, and he's going over those options now. Temptation has to be to just play Phoenix at this point. Your opponent's on two lands. But, you know, if it does get Lava Coiled, you feel pretty bad. Yeah, walking into a Lava Coil is, does feel a little bit bad. It's not really the worst, especially if Paulo is stuck on two lands. If mm -hmm. he can't do anything else and it's just a Lava Coil and attack for three damage, well, Bray's winning that race and he's got another Phoenix and he still has some answers in his hand. Mm -hmm. Now, the real problem becomes if he's able to go, like, Light, light up the stage into la or lava coil into light up the stage ah. more or less and then you might get really punished for uh, for your attack but doesn't look like nope that's available it wasn't a land and it wasn't a lava coil off the top of the library there for Dama de Rosa is it desperation time for him no he's just going to pass the turn back once again facing down eight power with only two on his side of the battlefield and now once again Sato has some choices and it looks like he's going to go Potentially for his Cinder Vines. Yeah, he's considering casting the Cinder Vines here so that if Paulo is going to cast a Lightning Strike or Wizard's Lightning on the Rekindling Phoenix, if he does it in combat, if it's attacking, he takes an extra point of damage, um, you know, just, just to punish his life total a little bit more, if that's his plan of attack. And then he kind of knows what's up with Paulo's hand a little bit better than if he just attacks and isn't really sure. If he attacks with both these creatures and plays Rekindling Phoenix, um, you know, after Paulo takes eight, he could have potentially killed the Phoenix, untapped, played Chain Whirler. Unfortunately for Paulo, he's just too far behind. He can't take even the single hit here. That's right. And you have to be thinking that if you're in Ray Sato's seat, that it's not, un, you know, that it's probable that Paulo could have access to a Chain Whirler and just simply be one land away from right. casting it. So he's going to change his plan just slightly here and uh, take out the Steamkin. This makes a lot of sense. And he still has access, of course, to this rekindling or excuse me, this uh, Cinder Vines is what I meant to say. And he's going to play that here. There is a land off the top of the library. Sato won't be happy to see that when it hits the battlefield, but he'll be relieved when there's no uh, Chain Whirler to follow it up. Yeah, I mean, the land is really not a great draw here for Paulo just because this... I assume the Lava Runner was going to get through anyway, and he could have light up the stages online and potentially find a little bit more to do. 
He might just be concerned that he can't cast enough spells because of the Cinder Vines now. Oh, that's brutal. And Cinder Vines already has taken a little bit of tax there on Paulo's life total pingdom. So. And here's another one. So the Cinder Vines has already done two damage and just provides that future protection against uh, Frenzy. So Thorn Lieutenant off the top of the library, but it's just time to go big or go home here for Ray Sato. He's going to play Rekindling Phoenix, get in for four, and P Paulo's going to be down to just six life, facing down eight power and a Cinder Vines here. Eric, this does not seem like a tenable situation here for the Hall of Famer. Right, I mean, we talk about with a lot of the situations with Mono Red is that you can start running off things like Light Up the Stages, Experimental Frenzies, et cetera, to, to potentially come back in these games. Cinder Vines means no, you can't do that. So even if he's able to find, you know, Lava Coil and some answers to these spellbergs, you just can't play the spells to actually win. And you can see that Paulo's now forced to try to get in for damage to get this Light Up the Stage cheaper, and Sato's like, sure. Like, that's fine. If you're casting a light up the stage, you're taking one from Cinder Vines anyway. And now on board. anything keeps you dead, and that is going to do it. Ray Sato takes down the Hall of Famer, Paulo Vitor, Domino Rosa, and his division. Very impressive. That's really a straight impressive. by to the top 16. Day two uh, to the Arena Mythic Championship 3 coming up in a couple weeks here. So congratulations to Ray Sato. You did it. Yeah, Japanese players killed at this split. They really did. And it was interesting, uh, two weeks ago to to the MPL, they brought they all brought the Golgari mid-range. Yep, the land was, death. Yeah, it was oh, such an interesting deck. I hadn't seen one like that before, so it was cool to see. Uh, but it seems um, a lot of people re reverted back to something that they knew a little I haven't seen better. one like that before or since. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you can do in week three, but week four and five. Now that's a different thing in the Spark Split. And we do have the standings that we can take a look at, see how it ended up. A tough wow. division to be in. Piotr Golgowski, 5-2, almost took it, but Ray Sato with the 6-1 record. Super impressive from Ray. Mm -hmm. That is uh, really an awesome performance against this caliber of player, and it was hard mode till the end there. He had to play against Paulo in the last round and pick up that match to put himself ahead of the field, and he was able to do so. Really impressed. Yeah, this division was totally stacked top to bottom, and... Six and one record against that field, uh, it's unbelievable, yeah. I mean, it's so I was looking down the list and I think, oh, they're a great player, they're a great player. Oh wait, all 32 of these players are so, so talented and you've seen such great stuff from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so many top finishes for so many of them. It's really, it's really cool to see. And as Marshall pointed out, of course, Paulo is the best of all of us. And so beating him is worth the most. Oh, yeah, well. Do you get uh, an extra ouch. mythic point? Or something for yeah, no, you, you no. have to ask. I don't All right. <laughs> Only if he chooses to give you one because he doesn't even need it. <laughs> All right. Now we do. Uh, I just want to mention our championship one more time is coming up June 21st to 23rd. That's going to be in Vegas. You might see us there. In fact, you definitely will. And uh, we do have a summary video for all of this division. Then a short break. We'll be back. Sapphire Division saw the rise of Ray Sato. After losing to Autumn Burchett in Week 1, Sato never lost another match, and, in fact, only lost two more games in the rest of the Spark split, making him the Division's clear champion. In addition to tight play, Sato always seemed one step ahead of the field when it came to deck choice, bringing the most varied and interesting slate of decks across the Division, and always tending to stack up well against the opposition. In week one, Sato played Azorius Aggro, which, in a turn away from usual so-called Azorius Aggro builds, actually had a blue card in the main deck. That card, of course, was Teferi Time Raveler. Sato defeated Marcio Carvalho that week. Carvalho played Mono White Aggro, and Sato won the match by gaining incremental advantages where he could, most notably by flipping a Legion's Landing and churning out vampires every turn. However, Sato also lost to Autumn Burchett on Mono Red Aggro in week one. Sato's Game 2 versus Burchett highlighted the power of Experimental Frenzy. While Sato had an onboard advantage through the middle of Game 2, Burchett was patient and eventually overcame Sato's larger creatures by simply being able to cast more spells. That left Sato at an unimpressive 1-1 after the first week. In week two, Sato brought Bant mid-range with all-star God Eternal Oketra. He played against Andrea Mangucci on Esper Control, a tight matchup that relied on Oketra to fight through Mangucci's long list of removal. In the critical game three, Sato looked to be struggling with only two lands in play, but he made the most of what he had, countering Mangucci's Teferi, chipping in with small attacks, and finally landing in Oketra. Sato took the game and the match. Next came week three in Sato's match against Jean-Emmanuel Duprat. 
Deprod tried to resuscitate Teamer Reclamation, a deck whose popularity has waned since War of the Spark hit standard, while Sato brought a Golgari mid-range deck crafted by the MPL's three Japanese players specifically for that week's matches. Sato crushed Depra in two quick games in which he mercilessly destroyed Depra's lands with Assassin's Trophy and Field of Ruin. Since Depra only had two basics to get, he quickly ran out of lands entirely, and that was it. In game two, Sato just had too many ways to interact with Depra's demanding mana and enchantments, so Depra's deck never really got to do its thing, by which I mean cast any relevant spells. It could make a lot of mana, but that doesn't exactly stop Carnage Tyrant. Last week, we saw Sato, piloting Gruul mid-range, defeat Pyotr Glagowski in our Sapphire feature match. Glagowski played Esper mid-range, and back-to-back -back Domri and Nyssa locked up game one for Sato, and neither card draw nor discard could save Glagowski from the onslaught. In game two, Glagowski had more interaction, but a timely Nyssa kept the pressure on as Glagowski tried but failed to stabilize. In Sato's Week 4 match against Mike Sigrist, it was a race to zero as Gruul Midrange and Mono Red Aggro battled. Sato's bigger creatures once again got the job done, plus a pair of Cinder Vines out of the sideboard in Game 2 kept Sigrist from sticking an experimental frenzy. And that brought Sato to Week 5, where all he had to do was defeat Paolo Vitor Damodorosa, a Hall of Fame member with a nearly uncountable number of top 8s, to win the Sapphire Division.